Hello and welcome to Hurt Less, Live More with me, JJ, the Practical Alchemist and Dr. Mark Goulston, the Psychiatrist. Uh, and today we have um, a fantastic guest who is a neuroscientist and she's an integrated success coach. Now she's traveled the world, been to 30 odd countries, um, you know, she's been th- and she's been through the mill. And, and Mark, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted Laura to come on to the show is because she has been through it firsthand, knows all the things that we do to run away from our hurt, all the coping mechanisms, and she's come through the other end. And it's a name is Laura Ellera. And uh, Laura, welcome to the show. And, uh, you know, just give us an overview of just an overview yeah. of where what you've come through. Gosh. Well, thanks. First of all, thanks for having me. Um, I guess a, a very brief overview of what I, I've overcome is um, well, crippling imposter syndrome, anxiety, depression, um, attempted suicide, um, bordering alcoholism, um, two mental breakdowns. Uh, <laughs> I think that's probably all of them. <laughs> um, that's probably enough for a lifetime, right? Um, and and I've yeah worked worked my way through them predominantly, well, mainly using holistic therapies, using meditation, using uh, understanding my nervous system has been the main one, which is what got me into neuroscience, which is why I'm I'm now doing a master's in neuroscience at the moment. So that's a very whistle, brief whistle stop tour of what's been going on, but I guess that gives you a flavour for what's been happening. It's been a lot. It's been a lot. Hasn't it's been it? it's been busy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, Mark, uh, uh, Laura, you can see why I wanted Laura to come on the show. <laughs> um, there's a saying, you had me at hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you had me at hello, Laura. And, and uh, you know, a little bit about this show and why it's called Hurt Less, Live More is, uh, you know, we know that a majority of the audience are hardworking women between 25 and 45 and our view is that they're overwhelmed that they're stressed out yeah they certainly don't have time for themselves and uh and our view also is that if we could help them hurt a little less uh that would uh keep them from doing things that are destructive and, and we believe that having conversations in which people like the three of us can talk about uh, how how the word hurt, how we each relate to the word, mm-hmm. and uh, and hopefully our listeners can listen into it, relate to it, and take away from it some sense of comfort as opposed to running to fix it and putting lipstick on a pain yeah and don't we do that all the time don't we put a sticky plaster on it we never deal with the the true underlying thing i think as well it's it, like for me the opposite of hurt is, is hope as well i think that was one of the main things that when um whenever it's been dark and been bad it's it's hope has been the thing that's and it's i've been hurting at the time but i feel like it's hope that's missing um so i think that's a key thing but what you just said about you know putting lipstick on and don't we do that? i mean we do that physically don't we we actually do it, 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 it you know in reality we put lipstick on we do our face up we go to work we go drop the kids off at school we smile we tell everybody it's it's fine how are you i'm fine and yeah. underneath you just never know what's going on with somebody and i think that scared and confused a lot of my friends i got told by so many of my friends that i couldn't possibly be depressed because I'm a happy jolly person and I'm always smiling and it's like but you just never know what's going on under the surface so I think if the listeners can understand that and and appreciate that and know that that's normal and that's okay then then that is I mean that's a big win for me to go away with today I guess so so if we uh, you know there's a movie out called Avatar it's made a few it's made a few pounds yeah and uh uh, if we created an avatar today for some of our listeners who are listening in and saying, uh, I can't make the hurt go away. Mm. I try to run away from it. 
but it comes back to me. Uh, and if they were to pose that question to all three of us, uh, how do I make the hurt go away, or how do I, how do I make it hurt less? Maybe all of us can weigh in. And Laura, you're our guest, so <laughs> how would you how would you respond to that I, from I, our audience? I think you're never going to outrun. You're never going to outrun your demons. You're never going to outrun your hurt. And I think when you try to, and I've physically tried to, I did an Ironman when I um, when I was diagnosed with postnatal depression. I was physically trying to run away from my problems. And I can promise you, when you stop, and at some point you have to stop, they're still there over your shoulder when you finish. So, I think, um, I th- it's for me, it's about turning around and facing them, because you take the power away when you do that, and it's it's scary, it's hard. Um, it's it's uncomfortable and it's not the thing we want to do. That's why we drink. That's why we shop. That's why we overwork. That's why we distract ourselves with a million and one other things because although we know that's hurting us, it's more comfortable than actually facing the thing that's really causing, again, that underlying that underlying thing. So, so for me, it's not about running. It's about stopping and being kind to ourselves and, and giving ourselves the grace and the space to to focus on you know what really is this thing what is causing this and and what can we do to 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 really help it as opposed to just putting that sticky plaster on yeah absolutely and as you were speaking i was uh, remembering a a passage which has stuck with me for many many years from the writings of a woman who lived i think it was in new york in the 20s uh, florence scovel shin and she wrote the game of life uh, a book with all kinds of really incredible um, wisdom. And one of the passages that stuck with me is that we have to turn around and face the lions, the ferocious lions, I'm probably paraphrasing her, the ferocious lions standing on our path and watch them turn into friendly Airedales. Mm. And there was something about the friendly Airedales that's always stuck in my mind because they are the most friendly looking dogs. <laughs> They're absolutely gorgeous. And it, but it was such a, a beautiful way of phrasing it. Yeah. And so that's, I, I can't say that I've always managed to do that, but it's something that stuck with me. Did you know of, Fro- of Florence Scovelshin's work, Mark? No, thank you for introducing me to it. That, uh, uh, I'm going to look at Airedales. We don't see that many of them here in no. Los Angeles. Uh, <laughs> we we see a bunch of airheads, but we don't see too many Airedales. Um, but it, it, something th- that the two of you uh, caused me to remember, uh, uh, I have another podcast called My Wake Up Call, and I had a, a guest on named Chip Conley. And Chip Conley uh, owned a chain of hotels called Joie de Vivre Hotels. And he sold them and he got involved with Airbnb. And he reached a point where he had all the money that he needed, but five of his friends died by suicide. He was depressed and suicidal. And he realized that he was addicted to achievement, but it wasn't saving him. And and it was interesting on the podcast, and we became friends because of my podcast, I often give people unsolicited coaching. I asked their permission, and he pivoted to something called the Modern Elder Academy, uh, in which he has these retreats in uh, a part of Mexico uh, for people, I think, probably 50 and over about, you know, something's missing in life. And and then he started selling me on it. And I said, Chip, Chip, you're doing it again. You're addicted to achievement. You're selling me on this modern elder academy. <laughs> and then I posed something to him. And I'm, I'm sure I, I've spoken about this in a previous show, but Laura hasn't heard about it. And I said, Chip, I think you have the syndrome of disavowed yearning. And he said, what is that? I said, in the womb, we're whole. You know, our wish is our mother's command. Uh, we don't go hungry. We're, we're warm. And then we're plopped out into life. And we go from omnipotent and whole to we can't communicate what we need. And we scream loudly. And uh, and what happens is we need, we're looking for something that will cause us to feel whole and peaceful. And it's not to be had. And I said, there's a number of people 
who discover achievement, which gets a pat on the head and a smile from mom or dad, and uh, and they convince themselves they don't need the connection. So they dis- they disavow the yearning. They yearn for it to feel whole, but it's not there. And they discover achievement, which can keep you going until you're in your fifties, until it doesn't. And then, uh, uh, and you may want to discover or allow the yearning to come out. And I think the yearning has something to do with being connected to other people and connected to ourselves. And uh, and maybe you can pivot to that. So does that make sense to either of you? One hundred percent. I mean, I was writing that down when you said something's missing in life. I was thinking the thing that's missing in people's lives is themselves. And that's what you're sort of just saying. They're not. We're so busy to get all the possessions in the world. But science shows that possessions don't make us happy. That's why you've got, you know, the richest people in the world that are still unhappy, still committing suicide, because it's that's not what that it doesn't give them that that thing that they want. Um, because they don't know themselves, they don't. They've never really met themselves, not their true self. Without all the masks, and you know, we put all these masks up, don't we? And yeah, we get to a stage where we forget who the real person is inside because we've been so many different people for so many for so many others that we no longer know who we are. Um, and I think that's you know, it's a massive thing of being able to just step back and, and or, or even step inwards and find who we are again, and to be confident enough to be that person. But whilst ever we're trying to find that person by the latest sports car or, you know, the newest dress or whatever it is that that season, it's always empty. And that's why we look for it elsewhere. And the whole thing with the achievement thing, I can I'm I'm nodding along because I'm totally relating to that because I'm like, yeah, because when you're little, you know, if you do something good and you achieve something, you do, you get that pat on your back and you get, you know, that lovely dopamine hit. And it's like, oh, so this is how I do it. Um so you do it more and more, but the more you achieve, the harder it is to keep that achievement up because you have to achieve more to get the praise, to get the dopamine hit, and you get in into such a horrible, vicious cycle. And I think, you know, I'm, I, I say I'm a recovering perfectionist because that was my thing as I was growing up and still is to some extent because I didn't feel safe just being me. I had to prove I was better than who I was. And I think that a lot of people walk around with that. I don't know, JJ, if you, you want to add to that, because I well, just jumped I, in because I was so <laughs> passionate about that bit. <laughs> no, I, I was just nodding at, at that bit. You having, having to prove that you're better than you feel you are. Yeah. 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 Because <laughs> there is really no need for any of that. But of course, the way that we have been conditioned and the way we uh, developed, we think that we have to prove that we're better Absolutely. than we really are. And, um, Yes, and you know, in my life, not very, not very much that I did was able to convince, or or somehow I was never able to get that affirmation from from my family, for instance, and and so, you know, you look for it in other ways, and none of them, none of them are really work, and actually, in the end, it comes down to being at peace with yourself, and that's not an easy. Um, path to tread because for a lot of us there are too, just so many barriers um so getting to know yourself is also key and i notice that you talk about how it took you seven years to get to a point where you felt that you could be successful yeah um uh, yeah. but other people don't have to and i think that's the exciting thing these days is that so many of us are realizing the shortcuts if you like and are able to help other people through. I mean, people like Mark, you, you know, it's fantastic that uh, we're able to support people as they find themselves and realize that they are a success. I guess that's, that's, that's got, got everybody quiet now. <laughs> Nobody wants to come back on that one. <laughs> no, I was going to say, I guess it's, it's how we define success as well. And I'm always really yeah. cautious of that, that when I say success, I think a lot of people automatically think money, you know, status. Of um, and to me, that's not, the only part of success obviously that, that that's some part of it but i think success as well is how happy we are how how mentally well we are how yeah. physically well we are what we're like with our relationships you know do do we have loved ones close by have we got that connection that we crave and need um and i think it's all of those things and i think that's what people are waking up to now whereas we had sort of the you know the generations of trying to make the money and make the status and and, and all of that i think a lot of people now are going well that's not enough you know, that's great. I've got that now. 
that's not it's empty it's it's a hollow it's a hollow success and that's often when you then look for something else and that's when it's about finding more of of what's internal what's what's inside of us rather than those external possessions yeah no exactly and uh i know that um i find i'm more and more um impatient with people or organizations who just uh, measure success by the yacht or the car or the house or you know all of these things because that's not really in my mind what it's all about what do you think mark Oh, I have lots of thoughts. I'm wondering when we're coming to the first break because I, because I have a chunk that I want to lay on both of you. <laughs> well, I tell you what, let's go to that break right now, and uh, and we'll we'll lay ourselves before you, <laughs> ready to receive um, right after these messages from our station sponsors. Back after this. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. And you're listening to Hurt Less, Live More on UK Health Radio with me, JJ, the Practical Alchemist, Dr. Mark Goulston, and our guest today, neuroscientist and coach, Laura Ellera. And Mark, you're ready to just lay something on us. Go for it. We're ready. (laughs) So um, uh, some years ago, I was coaching this high-achieving woman who had everything but peace of mind. And, uh, and, And I said to her, and I want each of you to try this on and see where you get. I said, I know what you're afraid of, and it's not criticism, it's not rejection, it's not failure. Uh, you don't like any of those, but you've dealt with a lot of those, sometimes better, sometimes poorly, and that's not what you're afraid of. And she had all this makeup on, and she looked wonderful, and she stuck her chin out at me, and she said, so what am I afraid of? And she just stared at me, and I said, I think what you're afraid of is feeling unconditionally safe and unconditionally loved and there is nothing you can do to earn it, and there's nothing you can do to lose it. And she went, what? And then I repeated that. And then she paused, and I looked into her eyes, and her eyes started to tear up. And they started to tear up even more. And then she started to cry. And then she started to sob. And then she it was she was in a there's a couch that she was seated on and she just collapsed to her side and she just started sobbing and she cried for I don't know five seven minutes and then she got up and her mascara was just running down her face it was like uh, it was it was a mess and she looked about ten pounds lighter and she had a big smile on her face. And she said, you just hit a nerve that is so deep, I don't even know what it's attached to, but I know it's all true. And she said, I've been looking for that all my life, and everything I do to get me there takes me further away from it. And and then she went on, she said, I've never felt that. And I'm a great coper. And anytime I even came close to pain, I just swept it under the rug. And then I just uh, pushed on. And the rug's getting pretty lumpy. (laughs) And I need to pick it up. But I'm afraid if I do, even though I know it will heal me, there's a part of me that feels I won't be able to handle it. And and then she said, I know two speeds, uh, pedal to the metal and exhausted. 
and I don't know anything else, and I'm tired. So can you relate? Can either of you relate to that? I'm nodding, but I'm looking at JJ. <laughs> no, you want me to speak first. <laughs> you want me to speak first. Well, I, I will say that uh, a lumpy rug is now alongside friendly Airedales. I'm going to be rem- remembering that that mental image uh, for the rest of my life. Uh, yeah, we. It's um, that. I think that is what we find difficult. It's it's uh, being accepted being accepted for just exactly what we are who we are um unconditionally unconditionally loved i think so many of us and that's been me and probably is still me to a certain extent i mean i I don't know how i don't know what that is but i tell you one thing i'm doing now and that is i don't try anymore to get there i've stopped pushing for that for anything like that I'm, i'm just Settling into being me and just doing what I need to do. And, um, and it's, it, it seems to be kind of working. I'm, I'm, you know, I feel a lot stronger and I feel a lot less susceptible to all those, you know, kind of, oh, but what ifs and how, you know, all those thoughts that go through your head. So yeah, yeah, completely relate to it. But I think I'm, I'm, I think letting go of that for me has been a key. Yeah. Yeah. Laura, could you relate to any of that? Yeah, I can totally relate to that. I, I, think, <laughs> I think very few people know what real, true, unconditional love is. I think that it's yeah. very, very difficult with all the stories and the past that we carry with us. And, you know, even I'm a mum of little kids. And as much as I'm aware of it, I'm sure I, I will still put, you know, I, I don't accept it when you're behaving like that sort of ideas, which, you know, and I should know better, <laughs> you know, Um and I know through my life, it's been absolutely like that. And I guess, you know, you're saying about um, she knows that it's there and she doesn't want to look at it. I think that's how I live for a long time. Like, I I can see it over my shoulder. Like, I mean, I call it like the darkness. It's just like this darkness following me around and I don't want to look at it. And I think, again, it's one of those things that keeps following you until it, you, you're forced to look at it. Um, but yeah, I can totally relate to that it's it's 110 percent or i'm actually exhaustion and I, i've been at exhaustion a few times in the past um but i think from my perspective what i've started to do is and very much so in the last six months even is putting more boundaries with people that oh yeah are not showing me the respect of the love that i deserve if that mm. makes sense so there's been some fairly large changes especially even in the last month or two um where I've gone, no, enough's enough. I deserve more than that. I deserve to be loved. I deserve to be fully respected. I deserve more than this. And this might not be that bad, but I'm not living with not that bad. I want to live with fully, you know, it, it's a hell yes or it's a it's a hell no. So um and that is scary and it's and it's ter- uh, terrible. <laughs> it's it's terrifying, it's exhausting, it's all of those things, but it's also completely liberating. Um, when you actually step up and you're honest with yourself and other people, what you will and will not accept. Mm. I mean, not using it as an excuse to be a horrible person. I think, you know, there's quite a lot of that that goes around. It's like, well, it's a boundary and it's actually just an excuse to be not a very nice person. I think when we put boundaries in place to respect ourselves and to respect our children and what they see as they're growing up, I think that's, that is not easy, but I'm finding very much worth it. Yeah, it's so interesting yeah. you're talking about boundaries because that's something that I've found myself getting really strict about. Not strict, but you know, I, I'm I'm really being quite uh, clear. That's a better word, clear yeah. about boundaries with with everybody. With every, I don't have time anymore to to you know suffer stuff that's draining me or or putting you know putting all their stuff onto me and that sort of thing. No, I'm I'm very clear about boundaries now. It's really interesting that you say that. Sorry, Mark, I interrupted you. Yeah, here's uh, here's something I've learned about boundaries. Um, I classify people as either givers, takers, or receivers. Uh, givers are just natural-born reciprocators. I mean, it, and, and and that's who I try to populate my life with. Mm. The takers are grabbers, 
And the receivers are kind of the belly of the bell-shaped curve. They're decent people, and they're happy to receive, but they don't spontaneously say, what can I do for you in return? And if you actually ask for something from the receivers, they will they will with z- they will delegate it to someone else with zero enthusiasm because uh, they checked a box. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we can do that, but they will never follow up because they're receivers. They're not givers. Uh, there was a book I was going to write. I come up with these best selling books, and and I think the two of you could write this book about boundaries, <laughs> and it, it'll be a bestseller. And it's called <laughs> Get Even Plus Ten Percent. Huh. Never be taken advantage again. Uh, it'd be a bestseller. I can't write it. I won't write it. But when I'm dealing with takers, uh, I'll give them every chance to to receive or give, and they fail. And what I'll and they'll often want something from me, and they'll get something from me. And I'll say to them, "This is a little bit passive aggressive, but I don't care." I'll say, "You know." One of the kinds of people that I can't stand are people that give and then take it back. Mm. And I and I just became one. <laughs> and they say, what? I say, you know those three things I said yes to? Uh, they're all no's now. <laughs> what? No, they're no's. In fact, they're not only no's, they're never going to happen. And I'm never going to talk to you again. So how is that? What? How can you say that? I gave you every chance to be a giver. I gave you every chance to maybe be a receiver. Uh, But where I am in life is I'm only developing relationships with people who are reciprocators. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and you failed every uh, every chance i gave you so no 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 goodbye <laughs> yeah i think that's pretty clear i could say <laughs> i think that gets the point across quite clearly <laughs> well i guess it, 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 it's like the banshees of inner sherm right yeah. with a grease and like i don't want to talk to you leave me alone <laughs> yeah but you didn't get the you didn't get the hint you didn't take it <laughs> That's absolutely true. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, you know, sometimes you have to be just really straightforwardly honest and spell it out because some yeah. people don't get it. Mm-hmm. No. And then uh, you get frustrated and you're like, well, if you're not telling them, we have a responsibility as well to 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 tell somebody like you just said. Yeah. But I think what you were saying before, JJ, about um, saying, you know, being strict about it. I think that you have to be, especially at first, if you're changing from being somebody that hasn't had boundaries. Mm. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure I could be quite as strict as Mark, although I'm now thinking I'm going to be. <laughs> but I think if you've been a people pleaser or you've, you know, you've always said yes, 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 yes all the time. Um, and then you start saying no. If we're not strict, people will challenge those boundaries. And especially when we first put them in and people be like, oh, no, don't be like, you know, I think like if people stop drinking, it's like, oh, don't be so boring. Oh, come on, just have one. And, you know, and it's that you have to be really strict on it. Before, uh, you can then l- loosen up a bit later. But when we're first putting those boundaries in, I think we have to be so strong because it's so easy if not to slip back and you almost lose the respect of that person. And the next time you put the boundary in place, they're like, yeah, she doesn't really mean it. Yeah, like, it's OK. Like, yeah, so, whatever you say. So. <laughs> So, Laura, I think you're going to like this. Uh, and you can do a whole course on this. I, I, I'm too old <laughs> to do much of anything, you except be on a show like this. Uh, and you can run with this. Show me a people pleaser, and I'll show you someone who has murderous rage inside themselves <laughs> that scares them so much. Yeah. They will please the other person before they let the, they, they allow themselves to feel that part of their personality. Mm -hmm. And what they need to realize is the thought is not the deed. Everybody has a dark shadow. It's called the Jungian shadow. And we all are capable of grudges, self-pity, anger, rage. And as long as we don't act on them, we're good to go. But people pleasers, often what happens is 
the other person is being so outrageous that we will please them to get away from them and our rage. Yeah. And I think that is doing so much damage internally because when we carry that around with us, I mean, just the effects of stress and anger and all the rest on our body and our brains and, you know, people pleasing is a sign to me that somebody doesn't feel good enough and that they're having to, I mean, I'm guilty as well. I'll do it. I'll, I'll be like, Oh no, I've got no time. I'm working till whatever time in the morning. Can you do this? Yeah, sure. I'm like, why did, why, why did I, yeah, why say, did I that? say that? <laughs> yeah. Where did that come from? Yeah. yeah. And I've got to say, I am getting better at it, but by no means perfect. But you do, you, you boil up inside because you, you, you then get so angry with yourself and it's so frustrating to be in that situation and you're then frustrated with yourself because you know you put yourself in that situation again um and i think that's again why this whole like boundaries and and being really strict at the beginning it's almost saying yes to yourself because whenever you say yes to somebody else you're saying no to yourself um so i think it's 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 reshaping it that you know it, it's how can i say yes to myself more um while still being a good person it doesn't mean we have to be you know just can't ever do anything for anybody else but um, yeah, I see that. I definitely see the the rage <laughs> internally. So, so, so here is something that we're going to get a lot of blowback. But again, if you're listening in, you probably know that I have a weird sense of humor. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, but I think what you can say, Laura, to these people, if you agree that we sometimes please them because we don't want to deal with our rage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and we're and we're becoming enraged because they've done something outrageous to us. We can't believe what they've done. So I think a way to be playful with it is, uh, I think I'm going to say no to everything you said, because I find that much easier to do than wishing you dead. I could do that. And worryingly, people wouldn't be surprised if I did <laughs> That's the worrying yeah. thing. <laughs> I, I think that's true. I, I, I could I do it playfully, yeah. I could imagine doing it as well, and yeah. people probably wouldn't be surprised. No, <laughs> but surprisingly, guess what? It's time for another break right now. Um, so let's just hold that thought, let all that rage out, while we listen to some soothing messages from our station sponsors. <laughs> The station that makes you feel good. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. And we're back with me, JJ, the Practical Alchemist, Dr. Mark Goulston, and our wonderful guest today, Laura Ellera, neuroscientist and coach. And um, Mark, I think you've got a a little bit more to say um, about um, maybe boundaries or maybe not. Is it? uh, Tell us what you have in your mind. Well, I, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse with the boundaries, so I want to pivot to uh, I want to pivot to parenting because uh, uh, Laura is a parent of young children, and uh, I'm a grandparent to four children, four and under. And there's something that I learned recently that I didn't do when I was a parent to my own children when they were young. Um, I, I'm fortunate because my children come over and they visit every day. And uh, and at this stage of my life, I do my best to get home so I can just be there. And when I'm there in the kitchen with my two daughters, my four grandchildren and my wife, I am completely ignored. Nobody asks me anything. Nobody says anything to me. I am completely ignored. But if I look at my uh, iPhone to check a message because I'm being ignored, they all stare at me with the stink eye. Like, how can you look at your phone? You know, and, and, I, and, and I went through this in my mind. I said, you know, if I was my father, who was a little bit prone to moodiness, uh, I would get up and just go somewhere else to watch sports because I'm being ignored. But I realize that I'm not being ignored. That I'm there uh, to be present. 
So I made this change. I decided I'll be there with them, even if nobody talks to me or looks at me, and I will not look at my phone. But I realized that I was thinking about what was on my phone. So while I'm being ignored, I would sneak in my mind to, I wonder if I got text messages. I wonder if I got some emails. I wonder if I got blah, 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 blah. And I realized that was pretty crappy too. So then I decided I'm not going to think of what's on my phone, even though I'm being ignored. And, And here's what I wish I'd known as a young parent. I am going to bathe my grandchildren in utter delight. So if they look at me, which they occasionally do if they're fiddling with something, they're going to see in my eyes utter delight, unconditional love, amazement. They're going to see that in my eyes, and I want to bathe them in it. And and I think it's working, because what will happen is you, they'll be doing something, and they'll look at me, and they'll look away, and then they'll take another scoop of ice cream of the utter delight. I mean, they'll look into my eyes, and they'll see that I am just there totally to be in amazement that they're in my life. And and they're taking another scoop of that because they're not getting that from their parents because their parents are so busy, as I was busy when my kids were young. In fact, my kids had a nickname for me, which was, Hi Kids, Bye Kids, Love You Kids. (laughs) And we laugh, but it's not funny. Mm. So I'm sharing that with you, Laura, that if you can, at some moments, you know, whether it's bedtime or whatever, and and it's about that unconditional safety and love that we talked about, uh, and it's... I'm just sharing it with you because, uh, uh, and it's interesting, I love my grown children, but they're all a bit tightly wound. And I think they might be tightly wound. To a certain extent, they're like you (laughs) all. And I'm thinking that if I had bathed them in utter delight, you know, maybe they'd be slightly less tightly wound. and, uh, And they're fine and they have, you know, they're supportive of each other and compared to how lousy grown kids can be, I really lucked out. And my wife gets a lot of the credit. And she gets credit for their being tightly wound, too. But uh, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if that makes any sense, but I am just sharing it. Because I wish I'd done more of it. Yeah, I'm definitely guilty of not doing enough of that. It's just, uh, I guess, because it just always feels so rushed everything feels so busy all the time we're you know frantically trying to get to the next sports match or school or work or you know and I know there are all ridiculous excuses because it doesn't take a long time to do that and I'm sort of going in my head I'm going yeah when they read on a night I can make it that that's my thing every time they read to me that I can that's the time that's the time that I'm doing that because I think when you do that once it's easier to bring it in more and more it's like it's like playing with them like I'm not a natural player with my kids I do it but I sort of almost feel jealous of the mums that seem to just revel in playing and making things and I'm just that just doesn't feel natural to me so somebody once said well just do it for five minutes and once you start doing it for five minutes you then find you you know half an hour's gone but it takes away that feeling of doing it all the time and I feel like this is sort of a similar thing where if I focus that one stage every day I do it when they're reading then that will become more of a program that I'll run more and more throughout the day as it becomes more and more like my natural go-to. So I, I like the idea of that a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, so here's a tip also for young children. If you're listening in and you have young children, um, if you read a book to them or read a story to them or they read it to you, uh, somewhere in the middle of the story or at the beginning of the story, but not at the end, you finish... You say to them, uh, what was the best thing that happened today to you? And what was the worst thing? And then whenever they say whatever they say, uh, pick an emotional word they use and say, say more about that, because they'll open up further to you. 
and then say, what are you most excited about tomorrow? And what are you most nervous about? And you do the same. And, and what you, what we want to do with our children is teach them that talking through these things, uh, uh, actually helps. It also gives them perspective that every day good things happen and not so good things happen, and we somehow make it through and resist the temptation to give them advice unless they ask for it. But if you can do that and then you and then you bookend it with the story, because you want to seal that part of the conversation in. And uh uh, I think it's something that they'll take with them through their life. You know, I do do that, but I do at the end of the story before they go to bed. So maybe I need to change that bit. <laughs> but yeah, I well, no, no, yeah. mix and ma- mix and match, and yeah. uh, see what see, see what works for you. But no, I think that's a beautiful thing to do as well. I just think because a lot of the time when you know if our kids are playing up or misbehaving or whatever, it is a cry for help. But in that moment, it can be hard, and you know. I read once, you know, why why is it so difficult for teenagers to talk to us? And it's like, well, because when they were children and they, they had big emotions, we told them to go and sit in their rooms and be quiet. And that really mm-hmm. stuck with me that, you know, that this is what we teach them or we we can, that that is one way. Um, so I think that is so important to get those habits of opening up and being able to talk and and, and be honest and like you say not jumping in and trying to fix because there's nothing more frustrating and we know it as adults as somebody trying to fix you because you're like I'm clever enough to fix the problem myself I just need somebody to I just need somebody to sort of bat the ideas off but we do it to our kids because we because we do it from love because we want to help and we want to save them but actually in the long run that's not that's not helping them so yeah I do yeah, like that a, yeah and as an adult there's nothing more infuriating I find than somebody trying to fix me you know you say that something's going on and they'll say well have you done this and have yeah. you done that <laughs> Just shut yes. up. I'm not All stupid. I want. <laughs> I know. So, so here, five, here, if you're listening in and you're a parent, write these five words down. Complain, blame, excuses, threats, moody. Complain, blame, excuses, threats, moody, because that is the language of teenagers. And what happens is when teenagers or younger children act that way, they trigger parents to being unempathic. And one of the reasons teenagers don't open up to parents is because they don't think their parents can understand their feelings. And that's because the teenagers are unaware that they're triggering their parents to not be empathic. And what's really important is knowing that underneath any of those things, something else is going on. So rather than being triggered, um, Allow them to say whatever it is, and then there's two questions you follow up with. What's that like for you? And they're going to go, what? Uh, So it could be any of those things. Yeah, what's that like for you? And they'll tell you. And then the second question is, what's really going on? Uh, And I'm a suicide specialist. None of my patients died in 30 years. You'll save some lives. Yeah, because if you just react to those five words, which is just a normal human reaction, yeah. they're going to think. Uh, uh, in fact, we just did a press release. I'm an executive producer on a, uh, and I'll send this to you, or I can send it to anyone who requests it. Uh, I'm an executive producer on a documentary called "What I Wish My Parents Knew," and the person who did it, his 14 year old son, killed himself five years ago. And so we interviewed teenagers about what is it that you wish your parents knew when you were at, at a low point? And they just shared it without complaining, blaming, excuses, threats, or being moody. And it's mesmerizing. When parents watch this, they see, oh, that's what's going on with my kids. And they go back to their kids crying, and their kids say, what's the matter? And the parents are much calmer and slow, and they say, "I just realized how much I love you." So I hope that's helpful. And I didn't, I didn't mean. I hope it's more helpful than it is depressing. No, I, mean, she, I think it's really helpful. I think you know, I try and remember whenever my kids are any of those things. You know that, it, that there's a scared little child under that somewhere. But 
and also knowing that when I'm reacting, there's a ch- scared little child somewhere inside of me that's reacting from the stories that I was brought up on and what what will it mean? What you know, if they're playing up in at the shops at Waitrose and everybody's staring, what does that mean? All the stories you bring with yourself, but it, it is that just catching that moment. And I mean, I my I don't know if I talked about this before, but um, I I walk around the house humming because I find that really calms me down because of the deep breathing and the breathe, slow breathing out and all the rest of it. And that can be really helpful just to put that pause in that moment before we need to react at our kids. Cause, and, and I'm not a saint. <laughs> I'm certainly not a saint. Um, but it does make a massive difference to just try and find that pause between the action and the, the, the reaction. And, and that's when humming or just taking a really deep, slow breath out can really help. But um, yeah, I think, I think, teenage suicide is even though my kids are so young is something that I'm already conscious of and really not worried about worried is probably the wrong word but certainly very conscious of because it's on the rise it's um it's such I was gonna say it can be so preventable if if we just listen and really hear not listen to but in not listen to give our own opinion not listen to all the stories that it can bring up about oh is it because I'm a bad parent or is it because I'm this of of being able to just detach and listen to the child within but I mean I'm I'm not there yet obviously mine are are quite young but it is it is terrifying what's going on at the moment well you know the challenge Laura for all of us is uh our when anyone we love or even people we don't love are in difficulty They want to feel felt, not just understood. Understood is still at arm's length. But when people feel felt, they feel that unconditional safety. Mm. And one of the difficulties most people have in causing someone to feel felt is it stirs up inside us the disavowed yearning at our never having felt felt. Absolutely. So it stirs up us having not felt listened to, having been traumatized by it, and having never healed completely from it. So so we step in. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, JJ. No, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And unfortunately, though, that's about, you know, we're coming to the end of the show. And that's about all we've got time for. I think, though, we're leaving um, on a hopeful note and uh, I will say that if anybody does want to see the film that uh, Mark's uh, executive producer of What I Wish My Parents Knew it's worth watching it's hugely powerful so um, impactful um, hearing these kids just talking very you know honestly and openly about how they felt it's absolutely wonderful I think Laura you will find it very, um, very informative and, uh, and powerful. And I'd say to anybody who is interested in Laura's work as well, lauraellera.com is the website to go to, uh, to find out more and actually find out more about Laura's backstory. And I do like your website, Laura, because it's very <laughs> playful. Uh, I like that. Um, it, you know, we don't have to be serious all the time. Absolutely. So, um, so thank you for doing that. And thank you for coming on the show. Uh, Mark, we're out of time. Uh, but, um, you know, I'd like to thank Laura for being our guest. If anybody is interested in any, in any of things that we've been talking about, do get in touch with us. And yeah, we'd love to hear from you, Mark. Yeah, I'll just say uh, tellmystory.org. Tellmystory.org is the site, and there's a link to the trailer of what I wish my parents knew. Tell My Story was the suicide note that my friend Jason Reed's 14-year-old son left, and he did a documentary, which is on Amazon Prime, called Tell My Story, but what was most powerful about it were the teenagers telling their story. That's why he created What I Wish My Parents Knew. Uh, That's fantastic. Thanks, Mark. So thank you again. Thank you for listening to everybody. Hopefully you'll tune in another time to Hurt Less, Live More. We'll look forward to it, but for now, goodbye. Goodbye.